Um, thank you very much for coming into this session. Um, so, my name is David Weston, um, aka Informed EDU. That's an underscore, not a hyphen. Um, I was never very good at writing on whiteboards. And um, I'm the Chief Executive of the Teach Development Trust, a charity I founded two years ago after having been a teacher. For nine years, I was a secondary maths and physics teacher and the general data geek. I was the spreadsheet man. Um, so I got very interested in professional development and uh, I was interested really in why as a professional I always felt like I was kind of trying to do things the way that other people thought I should do them and somehow it didn't really connect with what the children needed. And I thought, well, someone should try and do something about that. So I formed the charity, the Teach Development Trust, and here we are two years later. So I've been talking about professional development for a while and the interesting thing is every time I do a talk on it, I kind of slightly tweak what I'm doing. So we kind of, this is the latest iteration. Um, and I'd be really interested in your thoughts if you said, oh, well, you might have missed that, or you can add that, or that's really interesting and it links with something else. So just lots of feedback is good. Or abuse, anything via Twitter is good. Um, so before we begin, um, think about Think about three colleagues. No, sorry, interrupting you. Oh, that's right. Just to let you know that we'll keep going till twelve. Okay. Because I know you've been cut down on the Is that okay? And just keep talking. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. Um, so uh, think of three colleagues. Um, because the reason we're going to do this is because I'm going to give you some quite abstract thoughts and ideas and they might remain abstract unless you have something concrete to link them to. So if you have those three colleagues, one who's inexperienced, one who's a bit stuck and one who's experienced, or indeed just anyone else, then as I'm talking about things, I want you to keep going back to those three colleagues. If you've got a piece of paper in front of you, write them down and then just keep thinking, well, how would that affect number one, number two and number three? Because sometimes you might say, sounds like a good idea intellectually, but actually that wouldn't work for two, or that's not true for that, or it's not true for me. So I think that's quite a useful thing. So why are we trying to improve teaching at all? Uh, so I really love the Sutton Trust research. I have to say that I've changed the word teachers to teaching. Um, my reflection as a teacher is I had um, some sublime lessons and some absolutely rubbish ones, total rubbish. Some classes I would consistently be terrible, some classes I'd consistently be quite good. So I just think there's so much variation from your best day to your worst, I'd rather say teaching than teachers. Um, so basically what they noticed was if you took teachers who generally were making less progress across lots of classes, then the children who tended to do the worst from that were the children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, but if you were, if you in your teaching were generally making more progress with all of your students, then the ones who that made the biggest difference to were the most disadvantaged students. Now the nice thing is, there were kind of these top 20% I think of teachers who actually broadly made 40% more progress with their children year on year on year. But for the disadvantaged children, then the difference was making 50% more progress than they might otherwise have made versus 50% less. It's just enormous. Essentially, as we improve the quality of teaching, the children who stand to benefit the most are the most disadvantaged children. So, let's think about this for a minute. Put your hand up if you've ever tried to improve your teaching. I'm looking for anyone not using their hand up at the stage. <laughs> Make shame. Um, how many of you have been on courses to improve your teaching or conferences? <laughs> How many of you have read printed advice or books or Twitter to improve your teaching? Yeah. Um, okay, so the culture we all work in, actually, this is the most common thing that people experience with improving teaching. Teachers describe CPD primarily, blah, blah, blah. Very little active learning. So this is the classic, really, of you just sat there, you know, and me pretending, oh, but they put their hands up, so that's active. But actually, <laughs> pretty passive, just receiving. So professional development is mainly courses, consultants, lectures, books, printed guidance, and all that sort of thing. So that is the culture in which we tend to live. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing that happens, but across the country, broadly, we find that, it is found that, that's what teachers tend to experience the most. Now, the interesting thing is, um, if you take one of Hanushek and Rifkin's famous studies, um, which everyone loves Hanushek studies, particularly if they're economists. Basically, what he did was he looked at um, the, 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 the value that teachers were adding as they went on through their careers. This was math scores, and it was in the US. My suspicion is it's probably quite similar to what happens elsewhere. And basically what he said was, for the average mass of teachers, 
then you're more effective after a year of teaching than you were when you first started. And you're more effective after two years than one year, and you're more effective after three years than two years. But each time you go through a year, it made less difference. And then after about year four, five-ish, it kind of didn't make much difference. So basically, on average, people didn't really change their effectiveness much. Some did, some got more effective, some got less effective, but time was no longer the factor. It wasn't just being in school, doing the normal stuff you do in school that was making the difference. So have a think about this for a minute. How many people have ever watched a TV program about diet or eating? Or you didn't really want to and your partner was watching Secret Eaters. It's fine. <laughs> God, there were really tentative hands there. I'm not judging you. Um, keep, put your hands up again. Keep your hands up if the program made you aware of something new. You ever learned something new about nutrition or food or something. Okay. And then keep your hand up if that TV program made you sustainably change your habits as a result of that information. We've got kind of, kind of, normally at this point you might get one hand remaining. But the fascinating thing is, there's loads of us who go, yeah, I should probably eat a bit better. You want to do it a bit better. You're paying attention. You're looking at a really beautifully written story. They've illustrated it. You can see the emotion of these people going through the heartbreak of, I don't know why I'm not getting thinner. They're giving you digested facts. You really want to make the change. And yet somehow we all watch this and it doesn't make a difference to our everyday practice of eating. And if you reflect on that for the moment, that there are millions of people across the country who watch and want to do the things that they're seeing in those diet shows, but it doesn't actually change what they do because of habit. And then think for a moment about all the courses we go on. We want to be better teachers. We're really interested in what we see, but somehow it doesn't make much of a difference because of habit. Now, this is the problem. I've made this look as bad as I can possibly make it. <laughs> um, so the, the TDA um, commissioned some uh, research from Cure, Centre for Use of Research and Evidence and Education, they're great, um, and basically said, well, broadly speaking, from previous research, we know the sorts of things that make CPD transformative, as in it will take teaching uh, practice and sustainably change it such that students benefit. And then they basically said, okay, given previous research has shown us what sort of courses do that, let's go and see how many of those courses there are. And what they looked at, they found only 1% of what they looked at had those characteristics. 10% were what they would call at an embedding level. So if kind of you knew nothing about it, you might learn something. Which meant 90% of all these experiences were basically only scratching the surface or not even scratching. Which is a bit grim. And then the other grim thing is, as teachers, we tend not to know. So NFER did a study of their big panel of teachers, and they said, how do you evaluate the impact of CPD? And most people said, of course I evaluate the impact of CPD. You know, I, I ask a colleague, do you think it's made a difference? Or I fill in one of those sheets that said I would recommend this to someone else, a happy sheet. Um, but actually, how many people said, I fill in, I actually look to see the impact it's made on student learning, was only 7% of teachers. 11% of primary teachers, 3% of secondary. 11% is not good either, sorry. Um, so it's not very good, but to be fair, it's really hard to do. It's really hard if you go on a one-day course on uh, how to be an outstanding teacher, how are you possibly going to see, was that the thing that made the difference? Uh, it's really hard to do. And the trouble is, when you look at our professional development programmes, they're kind of like that. Lots of inset days, Lots of twilight sessions, senior leadership kind of say, we've got to do this, 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 we've got to do this. Bit of differentiation, top up on that, remind how to use the EpiPen, baby training thing, um, so on and so on and so on. Oh, and the annual miserable, this is what happens if child protection goes wrong lecture. Um, now, the trouble is, that's what research suggests doesn't work very well. It's in fact basically says, if you do that, unlikely to have any impact on your practice, even less likely to have an impact on students. And actually, you need to be spending probably at least 30 hours of thinking, of planning, of teaching, of reflecting, of discussing, of talking. You need to do that for a very long time to actually have any chance of making a difference. It's no, still no guarantee, but it's much more likely to make a difference. So perhaps we need to just have more professional development time Fewer things for more time. There's always going to be EpiPens and safeguarding. That's just the way the world goes. But we need to spend more time on other stuff. Um, 
here's some more questions for you, because it's being interactive. Uh, how many of you have learnt a new skill or improved skill in the last 20 years? <laughs> Look at a room full of learners. Um, how many of you improved it because you were really interested in it? Excellent. How many of you improved it because someone else really wanted you to do it, but you weren't interested at all? <laughs> a couple. Can I ask, why did you do it even though you weren't interested in it? Um, it, uh, it was a new job role. A new job role. Okay, so you're trying to impress someone. Yes. Okay, that's right. My wife was a vegetarian. Okay, so you did it. <laughs> okay, you're learning how to do vegetarian food because of a relationship. Yeah. And she knows more. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll move swiftly on past that one in case we get to a big debate. Um, anyone else? Who else was there? Um, who said they did it because of someone else? Yeah. Uh, learning a language. Learning language because... I was learning Italian and I was trying, but I'm not as good. Okay, right, so because of relationships then. So either it was because you were excited, or basically because you had a strong enough relationship with someone else that you did it anyway. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because nobody here said the person you didn't like told you to do it and you learned it anyway. Because we know we're motivated, when we're motivated we learn things, we pay attention to it. You can't possibly learn anything without paying attention to it, and unless you're motivated to remain paying it and keep pushing your attention back onto it, you're not likely to learn it. You have to be resilient to learn things. You have to put the time and the effort in and not go, oh, I'll go and do the thing I'd rather do. You've got to actively go out and seek new things because you're intellectually curious, or because of that relationship with the other person. Now contrast that for the moment with the head teacher, who you're a bit sceptical about, frankly, anyway, who just went on a course and comes in with the new book and says, this is the new thing, everyone, we're going to do this. And you're like, well, I don't really care, I'm just going to jump through the hoops. Whatever is the minimum I have to do to get them to shut up. Um, now, that's a problem, because that's not going to get you to really learn stuff, because you're not really motivated, you're not excited, and your relationship's not strong enough with them that it's going to make you do it anyway. So... Think about it from the senior leadership point of view, then actually you have to have really strong relationships with all those people in your school if you really want them to learn this stuff, or else they're gonna do it as superficially as they humanly can, like telling a 13-year-old boy to tidy up his room. As superficially as possible. It's all gonna be shove the stuff under the bed type learning, yeah? So, interestingly, um, Vivi Robinson, lovely study, she went round and she followed leaders around and said, what time are you spending, what time were they spending on different activities and how did that correlate with the improvements in student outcomes? And she noted five particular things which, which seemed to consistently improve student outcomes. And these are all good things to do. Ensuring an orderly, safe environment where students are happy coming to school, they feel safe. That was quite good at raising outcomes. Resourcing strategically, choosing the books rather than just taking whatever was given. Choosing how to timetable staff. Um, goals, really good goals. This is the vision of where we're going to go for. Uh, ensuring quality teaching, in that's instructional leadership. Here's the way we do this, let's all standardise it, watch me do it, now you do it, and so on. But, there's one thing that obviously was more effective than anything else, which was empowering the teachers to improve themselves. Now, the way Robinson says it is basically, if you get teachers to be better at identifying where the students are now, be better at that, where are they now, what are their needs, be better at, in a collegiate way, understanding the vision of where we want them to be, and then focusing on how do we get them from there to there. It's as simple as that. But it requires you to be better at knowing where they are now, requires you to be clearer about where it is they're going, and requires you to focus your professional practice on how to move them from there to there. And that's quite simple, but basically you need to lead the teachers to do it themselves. And that was the most effective thing. Now I think, and I've added to this slide, I think there are lots of things we need to do as teachers. Lots of bits of professional practice, and we need to do professional learning in all these areas. So we've got awareness. Do I have a big toolkit of strategies that I can use? Fluency. Can I just make them happen straight away? So it's not, it's, this is not a GP scenario where I tell you something and then you go, hmm, OK, you quickly open the book, you have a quick look, and then you say something to me. We can't do that as teachers. Although I bet everyone's gone to check the textbook at some point. Um, but we can't do that as teachers, so we just have to be fluent. It has to be 
what can I use now? Okay, I know what I want to use, bang, I can use it. And without any concern, I can use it, but I can also top right, adapt it as I want to. So I've got all these different strategies. You know, the little things you begin to learn, putting, touching the table as you go around, or standing near the children who are talking, or, you know, just little bits of body language, or this little understanding of how to move around the room, or all these little things you can do, when to slow, when to speed up, when to pause. And you can adapt them, depending on what's happening, because you can diagnose the suitability at all times. The teacher eye is something that anyone who's ever worked with a new teacher, you immediately see when they don't have it. Because you know when you're sat at the back of that room and you watch this new teacher, and you're going, oh, that child there, it's going mm -hmm. wrong and you can't see them, and ah! Because you have the teacher eye and they don't, and they're not recognising. They don't, not only do they not recognise the situation, they might see something's happening, but they don't know what it turns into. And you have to have that teacher eye. And then you need to understand kind of why, why these things are happening, because if you understand why these things are happening and why you're going to take a certain course of action, and fluently change, you need to know why and when not to. If we think about assessment for learning, Paul William and Black, it, no one, the, the national strategies weren't really concerned about why and making us all understand why we were writing our targets on the board. What's your level? I'm a 3C. What do you need to improve? Work harder. Comment only marking. Purple and green pen now, it's the big thing. But like, no one was ever like, why do you have to do that? You just have to do that, and you just do it. And this was a massive, massive frustration for me as a teacher. I know it's outstanding if I write my targets on the board, but I don't know why. Why is that supposed to help? I do it, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Why? But you're not telling me why, you're not engaging that level. You just have to do it to be outstanding. Frustrating. Emotional self-regulation. The will of steel that you develop, the armour. Um, and you have to have all of that, recognise what's happening with those students, 30 students in front of you at all times, and then of course be systematic. Problem with Twitter. Join Twitter, 2011, start reading lots of cool things, every week come into the class, new idea, put things up, I know, you're drawing a big Venn diagram and saying, right, we're going to use student organisers, we're going to do all this, and someone, student in a year 10 class goes, oh, one of your Twitter ideas, isn't it, sir? I was like, oh yeah, it is. You're not going to be doing it in two weeks, are you, sir? It's like, damning but true. Um, no systematic use of anything. So I never became fluent. I just liked doing stuff. It was fun, though, really fun. Now, I think also, if we pick on two aspects here, I have a B in my bonnet right now. Perhaps I won't in two weeks, I don't know. I have a B in my bonnet now about everyone is obsessing about this. The Education Down Foundation Toolkit, quite rightly, is finding interventions and things you have to do. It tells you lots of solutions. People, are pu publishers, are giving you lots of information about things to do, worksheets to use, programs to use, interventions that we use. It's all about this side. It's all the surgery, and maybe a little bit, if you're lucky, about varying and adapting it, and probably 